Hi, it's Clark on Temptress. Today I'm going to dive into BMSs a little deeper. I'm going to talk about balancing and more to the point, what's the difference between active and passive balancing and how does it actually work? All lithium iron phosphate batteries have a BMS. And the BMS is described in that earlier video. It's basically there to keep the batteries from self-destructing themselves like immediately. It's also there to make sure that the cells have an opportunity to all get balanced. It's usually a process you have to force by charging them in a very specific way, but the BMS is actually the one doing the job, doing the heavy lifting because you don't want to open the case and get right to the cells. You want uh, to be able to keep that battery whole. So today we're going to talk about balancing in particular. We're going to talk about the difference between what's called active balancing and what they refer to as passive balancing, though I have problems with that word. There's nothing passive about it. It's just a word they've chosen that's the opposite of active. Uh, we're going to talk about how both of those systems actually work in the electronics. It's not that complicated, at least at the high level. And uh, we're going to decide, is it worth paying extra money for an active balancer? This is a set of cells for a battery I've torn down a bit ago. Uh, this is what's inside a battery. So a battery would have a BMS and it would have uh, four cells if it's a 12 volt battery. I really should have my watch off because I'm near uh, a live battery and I don't want anything conductive on me in case I accidentally touch. Okay, touch with my fingers, but not with metal. Back to this. So it's four cells that makes it a 12 volt battery because they're just a little over three volts a piece. And we're going to talk about the idea of balance. Now, all of these need to be charged the same percent of charge. And percent of charge is a tricky thing with lithium iron phosphate batteries. You can't get it normally just by looking at voltage. They have this curve and it looks like this. They have this voltage curve, uh, percent of charge and voltage that has this shape. This is a little image I drew from the last video. Let's just concentrate on the black line here. And we call this like a double hockey stick because there's kind of like a hockey stick shape here. And then you get into between 20 and like 90%. It's pretty much flat. And then at 100%, it starts going up really fast. And yes, this is over 100% state of charge. You don't want to charge past a point that's really hard to define, but it isn't where the voltage gets really high. Up here, a little bit more power in the battery will result in a much higher voltage. And we need to get all the cells up into this range so that we can actually see what is different. Because the difference between 40% and 50% is an immeasurable amount of voltage. But the difference between 105 and 110 is a big voltage. So we overcharge the battery, which isn't good for them, but you know, you got to do it every now and again. And occasionally it's not going to affect the life in a, a measurable way. It's kind of like if you smoke every day, it's going to shorten your life. If you have three cigarettes in your life, it makes no difference at all. And battery balance is kind of like smoking a cigarette, bad for you, but you're doing it so seldom, it just doesn't matter in the noise of all the other things that are going to kill you. Um, so let's say this battery was such that the voltage, when I'm a little overcharged, the voltage of cell two here is actually uh, two tenths of a volt higher than cell one. Well, I can do a couple things. I could put a resistor right across these two poles. And I've got one here. This is a power resistor. It would be great for this uh, job. I've put some wires on it and I hooked it from here to here. It would burn power out of this cell, but only this cell. And I could do that for a while. And uh, eventually this one would come down to the same state of charge as this guy. And then these two would be balanced to each other. And I could do that for anyone that's higher than the minimum one. And then I add more power to the whole battery, which is all I can do from the outside and uh, do it again and keep doing it until they're all at the same voltage. And I'm way up in the high end of this hockey stick curve. 
The problem with doing that, and I've done it many times, I've done it in videos, is there's a lot of energy in these things. And when you start dissipating energy through a resistor, that energy has to go someplace. We can't just make it disappear. It goes into heat and this gets seriously hot. So you either can do it for like two minutes and then let it cool. Or what I started doing is actually wrapping it in a paper, a wet paper towel, and then using it to boil the water and, and keep re-wetting it. But um, just remember, getting rid of the energy is important, getting rid of that heat. The resistor approach, when put into a BMS, is what is referred to as a passive balancer. And it's limited by the fact that if it does it too fast, things are gonna get hot. And to keep this thing from overheating, it has to balance the cells really slowly, usually 100 milliamps, really, really slowly. That's why when you buy a new battery that has a passive balancer and a big cell, like I just did that 165 uh, Redodo, it took me over a week to balance it because at 100 milliamps, it just took that long to get them all equal. That's the downside of passive. The upside is it's simplistic which probably means less to fail, you know, fewer components, and it's cheap, it's really cheap. It does the job, it just takes longer. If you wanted to balance faster, you can do it in a different way. And they make integrated circuits that are just for this, and you add other components to them, but what you're making is what's called an isolated power supply, where I discharge this and I put the power someplace else. Even though these two are connected to each other and it's the negative of this one is connected to the positive of this one, because it's an isolated power supply, the power comes off this and then goes into here and that lets me move a lot of power. Usually those are rated for one or two amps. So 10 or 20 times faster than the passive. And it can get away with that because it's not burning the power and making heat that it has to dissipate somehow. It's actually shoving it into another cell. Now that's more efficient because the power that was here is now put into here. But honestly, we don't care about efficiency. Sometimes you care. I'm big on efficiency. But as far as balancing a cell, it means nothing. You're not gonna do it very often. Um, it just doesn't matter that you're wasting the energy. It matters that you're dissipating the heat and putting that energy someplace. So active is better because it can go faster. And if faster is important to you, if you want to be able to overcharge your batteries for literally like an hour and have them balance right up, you want an active balancer. But remember, you're going to balance these cells when you first buy the battery. That's just part of buying batteries from China. They don't do it. If they did do it, we can't count on them to have done it. So we have to do it ourselves if we want good long life. Um, so you do it when you first get the battery and then maybe every year you're gonna do it again. You're gonna learn that particular battery and how often it needs to be balanced by attempting to balance it. If it's like in balance, you go, oh geez, I can go two years. If it's wildly out of balance after a year, maybe every six months you're gonna have to balance the battery. Sorry, but sometimes uh, the cells aren't perfectly matched and this will happen. So, active balancer, is it worth it? Honestly, I don't think it is. It's, uh, like I said, it costs more. The BMSs that can do the trick aren't the cheapest ones available. So you're gonna have a hard time finding uh, a system with an active balancer that you're not paying $1,000 for the battery. Generally, stuff out of China is all about price point. And that's our fault because we're buying the cheapest one. If one is $5 cheaper, you know, on Amazon, you end up buying the $5 cheaper one if everything else looks equal. And they do whatever they can do to lower that price point. But on top of that, an active balancer has active circuitry. It has a lot of components. Any given component could fail. The passive one is just a switching transistor and a resistor. It's pretty simple. Two components. Let's hope they don't fail. So there's a definite case for buying the cheaper one, the slower one. And of the two, I, I think that's the right approach. That's probably uh, enough to describe the difference between active and passive uh, balancing, but I want to take this a step further. 
I have this thing called a bank manager. I'm not trying to make this a commercial for the bank manager, but I'm talking about something I'm thinking about doing in the future with this. Uh, just a quick recap, because I just pulled this off the table here. This is a device that really, truly knows how to charge lithium iron phosphate to 100%, not overcharge where damage happens, right to the point where it should go. If you were to charge your batteries routinely over 100%, it's very proven you shorten their life. If you charge it under 100%, you end up building a memory in the cells and that ends up essentially shortening the life or lowering their capacity. This guy has been proven to be able to solve these problems. This is the generation three. I'm gonna give you some clues about what's going on in my head. I'm thinking of what generation four should be. It would have come out this winter, but I, uh, I got sick. And there's videos on that. I won't be all maudlin, but I'm pretty healthy now. And it looks like I'm over it. So probably maybe next winter, I will start development again. And I'm gonna do one of two things or maybe both of them. One thing is I think I'm gonna make the bank manager talk to the Victron systems, which basically means not just Victron, but all the copycats of Victron. So the the big Chinese inverters that people are using in houses. It looks like I should be able to talk to them. And the bank manager can become the brain of that Victron system. The Victron system is wonderful at bringing all your charge sources together. And it's wonderful at really controlling the flow of amps. With the bank manager's algorithm attached to that, you've got something really great. The other thing I want to do, and I'm contemplating doing, is making my own BMS. It's kind of a different direction. And there's nothing saying I can't do both things in the device. But if I make my own BMS and I get associated with uh, like a Chinese battery uh, manufacturer, they could use my BMS instead of, uh, you know, what's available. And the features I would offer is, um, a mode, I would still leave a mode where you can overcharge the battery and it acts like a normal BMS. There would be a switch right on the battery uh, because you need to do that to do the balance uh, if you want to do it manually under your own control. I'm a big fan that we're the humans here. We can make the decisions. Even if it's the wrong decision, we're the humans. We get to make it. But uh, you put it in the other mode and the bank manager logic comes in and the battery will stop accepting power as soon as it's 100% charged, which is just something these things don't even have a clue about. So if you're one of the guys that's charging your battery until the BMS shuts off, just know you're killing your batteries. All right, now I'm the BMS. Now I'm responsible for all those safety things I talk about in the other video, but I'm also responsible for cell balance. And my algorithm is, well, better, um, and I've come up with a balancing algorithm that I'm going to call proactive balancing. And what proactive balancing will do is you will charge the batteries up into this hockey stick area. So all the cells are up here and the bank manager is going to look at the voltages and look at the differentials. Remember, he's also controlling charge. So he's saying, okay, I can see what the world looks like. We don't have to stay up here, it's dangerous. Things are happening that is bad for the chemistry. Now let's bring the voltage down. While it's down, it's gonna say, well, last time I checked, cell two was higher than cell one. So I'm gonna take some power out of cell two. And it's going to be a little bit arbitrary in how much it takes out. It'll be conservative, it won't take quite enough out. Uh, and then the next time it has a charge opportunity that's gonna go above 100%, it'll let it go above 100%, get that snapshot again, say, ah, oh, it's better. I got like 75% of what I should have taken. Okay, I've learned from this. Bring the voltage back down. During its off time, down here in the safe zone, it'll take a little more power out. Eventually, if everything works well, the algorithm will learn your batteries. And not only will it learn how much power to take out for a given, differential in voltage at a given percentage of charge and all of that. Things get real complicated, which is why other people don't do this. But it could also learn that over time, these ba this battery of cells gets out of balance really fast. 
Well, that means I have to do that analysis more often, even though it's a little dangerous, it's still the right thing to do to keep them in balance. And I can say every time I do the analysis, this battery, this cell always is the high guy. So I could like proactively take power like every month out of this cell, just, just throw it away. And then when I do my test, more likely I'm gonna be correct. I could also say, you know, six months later, I check it and it's fine. Well, I'm gonna wait a year before I do it again. You know, probably not a year, probably not six months, probably a function of charge cycles because that's what a battery really lives by. But there's no reason that, you know, the computer that's in the BMS can't count charge cycles. So that's what I see as proactive charging. Now, if you wanna steal my idea, yeah, you will. Uh, it's, it's a free world. Um, I could tell you though, if you don't have the base logic that the bank manager has, you really can't do this correctly because you don't know where the normal stop point is. So I don't think there's a great advantage to anyone kind of stealing that proactive part. It's like a lot of work to do 80% of what needs to be done. So I'm not gonna patent it or anything. Do it if you wanna do it, but kinda of wish you wouldn't because I would like to be first to market. <laughs> now let's see how lazy I am and when I get around to doing it. Oh, and by the way, I'll use a resistor. I will use the passive method of balancing because with proactive, we are absolutely not in a hurry. We're doing the balancing down here where no damage is happening. We've got all the time in the world, with like in the middle of the night, the battery's just sitting there. And um, it's just simpler, more reliable, and that's what I'm using. So my argument is, active balancer sounds sexy, but you probably really don't need one. Buy from Clark on 10%. I hope this helped.